unnerving trends, creepy photo shoots, and an uncanny obsession for the deceased. The Victorian era, which lasted 63 years, marked a time of significant socio-political change. The Victorians were prosperous, innovative, and creative, but they were also creepy and downright superstitious. According to the great author Charles Dickens, the Victorian era was a witty, disheartening, dramatic, and frightening time to be alive. Pour yourself a cup of tea and settle in as we explore some of the most insane practices that existed during the Victorian era today on Crunch History. Grave robbers, or as they like to refer to themselves, the Resurrectionists, were a constant problem in cemeteries during the Victorian era. They stole everything, from jewelry to the bodies of the deceased that wore them. Family members who had laid to rest their loved ones worried about them all the time. In order to protect their loved ones' remains, families who could afford to do so would go as far as buying metal caskets and building unusually high fences. But this begs the question, why were they stealing them in the first place? And given that it was rampant at the time, who was clamoring for this type of illicit market? You see, in the year 1752, the British government passed a law to reduce the country's death rate. The law required that the body of anyone who had committed the heinous crime of taking someone's life be donated to a medical institution or the person be given capital punishment. The passage of this law increased the supply of cadavers available to medical students for autopsies. This continued for more than 50 years until there was a surge in the number of new medical schools that opened. This increase resulted in a greater number of medical students than there were deceased available for dissection. There were only 49 legally received cadavers for 1,200 students in 1893. As a result, the majority of these institutions hired skilled laborers to go to local cemeteries and dig up remains to bring back to the training facilities. Believe it or not, it was legal for people to exhume the deceased from their graves and sell them. No questions asked. Politicians, lawyers, and judges all justified this heinous act by claiming it was for the public good. Doctors not only continued to buy this illicit product, but some, desperate for teaching materials for their students, became resurrectionists themselves. The Victorians' obsession with spirituality and death made the Victorians capture some truly eerie photographs. There were two particular types of photographs that were trending at the time. The first was the ghostly photographs of mothers behind veils, and the other was a post-mortem photograph which captured images of the deceased. Death was seen as a manifestation of God's will because the mortality rate was at an all-time high. But because losing a loved one is painful, the family members wanted to remember them even after they had passed away they became creative. Death photographs, the most well-known and visual expression of mourning, were born. This unsettling act evolved into a component of the mourning ritual at the time. Quite often, the photographer was instructed to capture two images of the deceased, one in which it appeared vibrant and alive, and the other in which it appeared serene and asleep. Ooh, and uh, yuck. Medicine obtained from the deceased was at its height in the 16th and 17th centuries, but persisted well into the Victorian era. Medical texts back then specified which morsels were good for which ailments, and there were recipe books that explained how to prepare the pieces too. One text from 1847 prescribes a bit of skull mixed with treacle as a treatment for epilepsy. And guess what? It didn't work. But that wasn't all. There was also a belief that something called a thieves' candle could cause paralysis. Now, typically, the candle was made from the hands of a deceased man. They had one or more of the fingers turned into candles. These candles were supposed to provide the user safety, invisibility, and the ability to cast sleep spells on whomever they wanted. This candle was therefore priceless to thieves. When a thief entered a house armed with the thief candle, they believed the candle, when placed, will not be seen by anyone except the user and those it's used on. And since they'd be fast asleep, no one will be able to stop the thieves. They also believed that those who perished in a bad manner produced the best candles. There was no shortage of reasons a woman could find herself committed to an insane asylum in the Victorian era. And once they were there, what were doctors to do with them? According to the teachings of Dr. R. Maurice Buck, the thing to do was to get rid of what was causing his patients madness, reproductive organs. A woman could be committed to an insane asylum for a variety of reasons during the Victorian era, but what were doctors to do with her once she was there? 
Dr. R. Maurice Buck believed that removing the reproductive organs that were driving his patients insane would be the best course of action for saving them. From 1877 to 1902, Dr. Buck oversaw the London Asylum for the Insane. Throughout that time, he operated on more than 200 patients in an effort to free them from whatever was making them crazy. That included 22 operations, 16 removal surgeries, and many more crazy attempts at crazy operations to reposition things. <laughs> yeah, you heard that right. He described some of his cases in a speech he gave to the American Medico Psychological Association in 1898, claiming his operation had saved a woman, ending her violent tendencies and seizures, and after the removal process, she was quite well. Despite the fact that the Victorian era was a time of technological advancement and progress, the Victorians were highly superstitious, and this was seen in the way they handled their deceased fluffies. Just as a deceased family member would get a creepy photo shoot to live on in the memories of their living relatives, a deceased pet would get something similar, albeit far more disturbing. Taxidermy, which is the act of preserving deceased animals, was done on their pets after they passed. So whenever a family pet passed away, a taxidermist would be hired to preserve the animal. To the family, this gave the pet a second life, and since it couldn't perish in this second shot at life, it was in a sense immortalized. A real-life example of this was the pet of Lady MacDonald. When her beloved pet Pug passed away, she decided to build a wooden cage and then hire a taxidermist to immortalize her pet, which she put in the wooden cage to decorate her parlor. Weird, right? You haven't heard the last of it. An English taxidermist named Walter Potter saw taxidermy as more than just a way to memorialize and immortalize your deceased pet. He considered it to be a magnificent work of art. After being inspired by Herman Pouquet's tableau, a German taxidermist with a similar style, young Potter began creating his own pieces after visiting the Great Exhibition of 1851. Potter was best known for his anthropomorphic animal dioramas that mimic real-life situations. Charles Dickens' earlier utterances have never been more accurate due to this unsettling practice. So, do you have more unsettling facts about the Victorian era you'd like to share? Tell us in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like and hit the subscribe button. And as always, thanks for watching Crunch History. We'll see you next time.